Dr. Menton holds a Ph.D. in cell biology from Brown University. As an associate professor of anatomy at Washington School of Medicine in St. Louis, Dr. Menton was awarded Professor of the Year in 1998. He is currently a full-time speaker and author for Answers in Genesis. In Form to Fly, Dr. Menton details the amazing design features of birds, while illustrating that the current view of bird evolution via dinosaurs is far from probable and goes against all observable evidence. Well, let's begin with Scripture. That's the way we ought to begin. Now look at the world through biblical glasses. And in Genesis chapter 1, verse 21, we learn straight away how birds came to be. There it tells us, God created every winged fowl after its kind, and God saw that it was good. The birds would have been created on the fifth day of creation, along with the sea creatures. And the land-dwelling creatures were created on the sixth day. And all dinosaurs are land-dwelling creatures. Therefore, birds were created separately on a separate day from dinosaurs. And that pretty well settles right there, the dinosaur bird uh, question. But we'll have occasion to touch on it as we go along here. Well, this is the standard sort of evolutionary chart of how birds are supposed to have evolved. We call these phylogenetic trees that show sort of in a branching way how things evolve. Now don't expect to see phylogenetic trees in nature. They do not grow in nature. They mainly only grow in biology textbooks. <laughs> but in the phylogenetic tree, uh, down at the bottom you have a reptile, and uh, nowadays they believe that reptile would have been a, a dinosaur, uh, a theropod type dinosaur. We'll talk about that more. And that from that dinosaur creature, uh, all of the birds sort of grew and branched off. And can't you just see, looking at the tree, how they all just sort of branched off from one another? Uh, here's a branch point right here. You, you go this way, we, you get a swan, and you go this way, and you get uh, a hummingbird. And I know you're really itching to know what the common ancestor of the swan and the hummingbird is. And if you look right there at the node of the tree, uh, that's where you will uh, see the common ancestors right in there. Now, some of you in the cheap seats are not able to see that. You may want to talk to the people down front. No, you see, the whole point is, is that there is no information in the nodes of the branches. This is the only area that would be of any interest. The tips of the branches merely show birds that are alive and well today, except for the first two all the way down at the bottom here. These birds are extinct, Archaeopteryx and Hesperornis, but we do see them in the fossil record. The rest of these are birds that we see today flying around. And the tree is just simply an artistic uh, expression. There is no data in the tree, whatever, and indeed none is shown. It's just sort of trying to give you an idea how they might have branched off without actually providing any evidence or data for it. In fact, I say that since an artist painted that silly tree and since they don't exist in nature, uh, let's just see what the whole thing would look like without the tree. And when you do that, you get something which is technically known as a bunch of birds. <laughs> So let's consider, down at the bottom is this little reptile. And this reptile is a dinosaur, and today evolutionists are just extraordinarily confident that birds evolved from reptiles. For example, uh, here 
uh, in a book, 101 Questions About Dinosaurs, published in 1996, we read a very confident statement by an evolutionist that says, because birds are dinosaurs, did you get that? They didn't say we think they might be, or many people suspect that, or it's just simply stated, because birds are dinosaurs, dinosaurs have not died out. Goes on to say, nevertheless, dinosaurs are still alive and very successful. Birds are their direct descendants of small meat-eating dinosaurs and in modern biological classification are considered to be a subset of the dinosauria. So they've actually put the birds under the dinosaurs and uh, classification. In this sense, dinosaurs are still very successful because there are more than 8,000 species alive today. You got that? More than 8,000 species of dinosaurs alive today uh, feeding in your bird feeders even as we speak. <laughs> then why is it the evolutionists get so upset when we say man and dinosaurs live together? <laughs> I know what you're asking. You're asking now, which group of dinosaurs did the birds evolve from? After all, the dinosaurs can be classified. And there's two basically different kinds of dinosaurs, and they're seen in the oval here. Uh, by the way, the reptiles that fly, the pterodactyls, are not dinosaurs. The reptiles that live in the sea, uh, plesiosaurs, pliosaurs, what have you, they are not considered dinosaurs either. They really need animals. They're just not dinosaurs. All dinosaurs walk on top of their legs. They're not like other lizards that are elbow out. They walk on top of their legs, and they are all land-dwelling creatures, and all dinosaurs are grouped into two major groups, the lizard-hipped and the bird-hipped. Oh, you can see where I'm going with this, can't you? The bird-hipped dinosaurs. In fact, some of the bird-hipped dinosaurs are actually called bird-hipped, bird-footed dinosaurs. So the lizard-hipped and the bird-hipped. This is really the difference between the two on your left is the lizard-hipped, if you want the fancy name, it's Cerician. Doesn't that sound a lot more impressive when you say Cerician? Uh, that's the lizard hip. And the lizard hip is pretty much like uh, a mammal's hips, or our hips. There are three bones that are fused together there. You have the ilium, that's the bone that you can feel right under your belt, the hip bone. And then you have the pubic bone. Uh, those are the bones that come together in front. And then you have the ischium bone, and at the end, we call that the ischial tuberosity, and you are all setting on your ischial tuberosities right now. <laughs> Those three bones are fused together. Now, in a bird, look at the dinosaur on the right. This is a bird hip dinosaur. It, too, has the ilium, just as the first one did. It, too, has a pubic bone. It, too, has an ischium. But what's different is that there's a process that comes from the pubic bone that's part of the pubic bone that comes back to the ischium. And this is true of birds, and uh, it's true of the bird-hipped dinosaurs. This is a lizard-hipped dinosaur. An example would be, for example, a T-Rex. And you can see the uh, hip bone here, this area right in here. This is leg bone coming down here. I'm not getting too technical, am I? I didn't think so, no. Uh, this is the ilium up here. And uh, these are the pubic bones over here. And this is the uh, ischium. And if we uh, compare that to a bird hip dinosaur, in this case a stegosaurus, uh, we can see the same bony components, except there's a part of the pubic bone that comes back with the issue. Now, did I tell you there was going to be an exam? <laughs> yeah, you see, us teachers are not paid a whole lot, and one of the few joys we get in life is persecuting students. <laughs> and we do that with exams. And in exams, we ask trick questions because we love to fail people. Which group of dinosaurs uh, did the birds evolve from? Do evolutionists say they evolved from the bird-hipped or the lizard-hipped? Good. There are a lot of you getting this right. It's very disappointing to me as a teacher. You're getting this right. <laughs> yes, they, they evolved, according to evolutionists, from the lizard hip, not the bird hip. They're so specialized, they say, that they couldn't have given rise. And yet, in the textbooks, they make a big thing out of, see how much like a bird these bird-hipped dinosaurs are. This is an example of one of the lizard hip dinosaurs that's been implicated at one time or another as the ancestor of birds. Uh, this is what we call a theropod type dinosaur and uh, uh, basically means a sort of mammal footed dinosaur. 
And all of these theropods have a few things in common that I think makes them very, very poor candidates for evolving into birds. Uh, for one thing, if you put feathers on this creature, uh, kick him in the tail, he's not flying. <laughs> I mean, this thing isn't going to fly. First of all, look at the size of the, I mean, look at the absolutely immense, I mean, look at this huge, do I dare say rump? Yeah, I mean, he's not getting off the ground. <laughs> and then a big, heavy tail that extends beyond that uh, heavy rump there has these big, massive hind limbs, but look at the front limbs. I mean, on most theropod dinosaurs, like the T-Rex, uh, the front limbs are so small, we're not sure what they did with them. It doesn't appear that they could have walked on them. They're too short, they couldn't have fed with them. They really couldn't have grasped their prey with them, but I'll tell you one thing they absolutely did not do with them. <laughs> Well, since we're talking about theropod dinosaurs, those kinds of dinosaurs have three fingers. And uh, it's been interesting, in recent years there have been people who've studied the development of fingers. Most organisms, vertebrates as they develop, are what we call pentadactyl, they have five fingers. But during the development in the embryo, on some creatures that end up with only three, two of the fingers will be resorbed or not fully developed uh, in the embryo. If you look at a bird, and on your left is an example of an ostrich uh, during development, and you'll notice that the first finger, comparable to the thumb, is very rudimentary and does not develop. The three fingers that you see expressed in the bird hand with which they fly, and of course these fingers are usually not free, although some birds they are, as I'll show you. Uh, finger two Finger three and finger four make up the bird hand with which it flies. If you look at a dinosaur, like Herrerasaurus here, that's supposed to be one of the early dinosaurs, it, like all other dinosaurs that have three fingers, the theropods that are believed to be ancestral to birds, uh, it's the first finger that's developed. And the second and the third, the fourth and fifth are rudimentary. So the hand is formed in a completely different way in the two organisms, and this has led some evolutionists, such as Alan Fiducia here, publishing in 2006 uh, in the Journal of Morphology, an article titled, Do Feathered Dinosaurs Exist? And this evolutionist says emphatically, no. But in addition to that, he points out that you couldn't get the hand of the bird to evolve into the hand of the dinosaur because different fingers are used in each. Well, let's look, since we're talking about bones, let's look at the bones of birds. They're kind of interesting. Uh, birds have a lot of vertebrae in their neck. Uh, all mammals have seven. I don't care if you're a mouse or a giraffe. You have seven vertebrae. That's what all of you have right now in your neck, unless you've had a vertebral resection. But birds can have, you know, a dozen or two dozen because they have very long necks. And this allows birds to turn their head all the way around and look to the rear. In fact, birds are able to take their beak here, and this makes that long neck with lots of vertebrae handy. They're able to take this beak and bring it all the way back to here. And that's important because right on the, under the surface of the skin back here is a gland called the uropygial gland that produces an oil. And the birds take their beak and reach all the way to here. I've tried this. I can get back about this far. And they stir their beak around in the uropygial gland, picking up the oil. And then you see how the birds are always pecking at their feathers and dragging their beak through the feathers. Uh, you know, we call that preening. As the bird preens its feathers, it works the oil into the feathers, and that's what makes the feathers waterproof. So a duck can swim in the water, for example, and the birds don't just soak through uh, to their skin every time it rains. So a marvelous gland that has to be reached, and thanks to all the vertebrae in the neck, they can do that. We mentioned that the three fingers of the bird are fused. You can see that up there, making up the hand, which is part of the wing. Uh, interesting characteristic of birds right down here, they have the wishbone. The wishbone is comparable to our collarbones, the clavicles. Uh, but in the case of the bird, instead of the collarbones just coming across here and stopping at the sternum, they go way down here and are fused together, 
And uh, that's this little springy affair that you probably all tugged on at one time or another to make a wish at Thanksgiving. And uh, that turns out to be used by the bird in flight because the bird has such powerful muscles that it flies with that these muscles actually make up a significant part of the weight of the whole bird. I mean, think of the white meat in a chicken. And a chicken isn't that powerful a flyer. And this uh, uh, powerful muscles, I mean, if a human had muscles uh, that were as big as these muscles in a chicken, it's the pectoralis major muscles. I mean, uh, we just have this huge chest, you know, ma massive muscles. Uh, and these muscles are so powerful to move those wings that they could just snap the clavicles. So the clavicles are springy so that when these powerful muscles are working in flight, those clavicles actually bend with each beat of the wings to take up the force that would otherwise snap them. Oh, there's so many neat things about birds. They have three toes in front, uh, at least uh, most birds. And then most birds have one toe behind. Uh, in the case of woodpeckers, they may have two behind. But we call this one behind the hallux, and that makes the foot a perching foot so that it can stand on a branch and hang on with the toe that goes behind. Another thing about the bird skeleton that's kind of intriguing uh, are the ribs. Uh, the ribs are kind of hitched to one another by little bony processes called the uncinate processes that kind of lock the ribs all together so they don't move very much. And you think of our ribs, our ribs are like the handle on a pail. Every time we inhale to breathe, if you think of the handle of a pail right here, when the handle comes up, there's a space between the handle and the pail. So our ribs go up and down like this as we breathe. It helps to bring the air in, but uh, the rib cage of the bird uh, is very, very solid compared to ours, and so they can't really use their ribs very effectively to breathe. You think, well, that's okay because, thank the Lord, you've always got the diaphragm muscle. That's this muscle that goes right across your body that divides the north half from the south half. And that's like a dome. And when you inhale, that diaphragm muscle comes down. And that really pulls the air in. Are you ready for this? Birds don't have a diaphragm muscle. As far as I'm concerned, that means birds can't breathe, which means there are no such things as birds, which brings me to the end of the lecture. Are there any questions? <laughs> No, it's incredible. They have a breathing system, a respiratory system, if you will, that is quite simply the most remarkable structure that uh, I think you can find in a bird. In fact, there's no other animal, and certainly not a reptile, that has a breathing apparatus like a bird. They start out pretty standard. You have a trachea, a very long one, because you think of the length of the neck of some birds. And it comes down and branches into two bronchi. There's an interesting little structure right in the fork there called the syrinx that the bird uses to produce its music and its sounds. And that story is so complicated and so marvelous that uh, one of these days I may just put together a, a lecture on bird sounds, but I want to polish up my lecture on mucus first. Uh, the bird has a pair of lungs, but the interesting thing, these lungs don't change much in shape. And you think, well, how does a bird breathe if the lungs just sort of set there, you know, inside the rib cage? Well, bird lungs have back doors and side doors and front doors. They have all kinds of little channels going out into air sacs. And whereas the lungs have blood vessels that allow the exchange of gas with blood for breathing, these air sacs really don't have much in the way of blood vessels, just enough to keep them alive. And they're basically like bellows. These air sacs are actually sandwiched out between the muscles of the limbs, and they also have branches that go just under the skin. Uh, branches of those air sacs actually go out inside the bones uh, of the bird which makes the bird very light. However, if you're going to put air inside the bones, then what don't you have in the bones? Marrow. And if you don't have marrow, you can't make blood, which pretty much brings us to the end of our lecture. <laughs> no, you see, they have another special organ just to make the blood. Uh, these air sacs, then, are actually, when the bird breathes, the air goes pretty much directly into the air sacs rather than into the lung. And then from the air sacs, as the bird moves, the air is expended, and it goes back out through the lungs. And it means that the root of air in the lungs is just going one direction. When we breathe, it's like blowing into a paper sack. You fill it up, and then you suck it out again, and you fill it up. In other words, you've got dead air and fresh air being mixed. 
not as efficient. This is an extraordinarily efficient system where the fresh air just keeps going through one way. Uh, these air sacs are also able to uh, blow up the skin. You've seen birds like the frigate bird and the prairie chicken. Uh, the prairie chicken in courtship display can puff up its skin of its neck. Have you seen that? In fact, the thing that's really neat, these airbags are just under the surface of skin. And birds that dive and hit the water at a high rate of speed, you can imagine with hollow bones, you break every bone in your body hitting the water at, say, 60 miles an hour. Well, thank the Lord, or I should say thank the federal government, that they have federally, federally mandated airbags under their skin, these diving birds. <laughs> you can see you don't believe a thing I'm telling you. Uh, but anyway, just before the bird hits the water, these airbags can blow up and take up some of the impact. No, of course it's not the government, it's the Lord, and does he think of everything or what? Well, I could go on about the lungs, but I really want to talk about feathers, since that's what I'm really interested in. Feathers, I believe, are unique to birds. You get it? That means dinosaurs don't have feathers, no matter what you may have read, and we'll talk about that. Uh, feathers are lightweight, and yet they're very strong for their weight. Feathers are waterproof, and we've already told you how they get waterproof. Uh, they're not made waterproof. They get coated with oil from that uropygial gland, and if they didn't, the bird would just soak right through. In fact, we know this is true because there's one variety of bird or species of bird that doesn't have a uropygial gland and therefore cannot oil its feathers. Uh, in America, we call that bird the anhanga. Some of you may have seen it in Florida. I took this picture in Australia in the rainforest, and over there they call our anhangas the Australian snake bird. They're similar to the cormorants, and these birds have dry feathers, and they have no gland, uh, preen gland, to oil their feathers. What this means is when it rains, they just soak right on through. In fact, they seem to use this dry feather function because they get into the uh, swamps there in the rainforest and in the Everglades they, they go right under the water and uh, they let their air apparently out of their bladders and lungs and when they go in the water they just sink like a rock because there's very little fat in the bird to make it float and they can walk around on the bottom of the water fishing because they just soak right through to the skin. Great idea. The problem is when they come out of the water, they can't fly. And so they have to stand on a log like this, and they're no fool. They hold their wings out to dry, and if the sun's up there, they go this way for a while, and we get that done, they turn around, do the other side. And when they dry out, they fly away. And until they can fly away, they've been called names like alligator bait or... Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, they are susceptible to predation by alligators. Another function of feathers is they conserve body heat. When you think about it, that's a, that's a great thing for a bird because birds have a high metabolic rate, just the opposite of reptiles that have a low metabolic rate. And uh, some birds fly at a very high altitude where the temperatures are quite low, and so it's important that they keep their body temperature just the right temperature even when flying in cold environments, and so the ability of the feathers to conserve heat is good. One interesting function of feathers you may never have heard about or read about is that they are used to excrete waste products of metabolism. You see, the feather is growing out of the skin, and it's never really coming back, right? It's a kind of a one-way trip, and eventually the feather will molt and be replaced with another one. And so waste products can be excreted into the feather follicle and put inside the feather, and it's a good way to get rid of things. We do the same thing with our fingernails and hair. can kind of throw waste products and metabolism into these structures. And you may think this is a little disgusting that birds do that with their feathers, but some of the colors that you see in birds are due to waste products and metabolism. In fact, there are three kinds of colors in a bird. The first one that we might mention is a pigment like we have. It's called melanin. It comes in brown and black and sometimes a reddish brown. And feathers uh, may have that kind of pigment. But, as we've already mentioned, they can excrete waste products in their uh, feathers. And the pink that you see in a flamingo, for example, results from some of the invertebrates that the flamingo eats. This is why it's important that exotic birds kept in a zoo, uh, well away from their native habitat, uh, should be fed a diet as close as possible to what they eat in their native habitat, or they will lose proper color uh, and grooming. Finally, my favorite source of color in a feather 
is that feathers have like a little film, a thin plastic film on the surface, and this behaves sort of like an oil slick, you know when you see an oil slick on water, and when light comes down and hits that oil film, which is very thin, then it hits the water underneath, it refracts back and produces these colors. Well, the iridescent colors that you see in birds, like the iridescent colors on a, on a grackle, are the result of this interference phenomenon. Well, the feather has an interesting shape. It's got a shape, something like an airplane wing, has a little bit of a curvature to it, and that imparts lift uh, in flight. Each of the feathers, at least the larger ones on the bird's body, certainly the primary feathers, and the tail feathers have muscles associated with them. And these muscles can actually take these feathers and move them front, back, up, down, and rotation. So the feathers can just be like Venetian blinds in flight. They can maybe close up the Venetian blinds on the downstroke and then open them on the upstroke. And uh, if this surprises you that feathers have muscles, think of the, uh, 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 the bird like the peacock. Those feathers are what, about a foot and a half, two feet long in the tail of a peacock? How far do you think the feather sticks in the skin? No more than about an inch. So we have a fulcrum that's way over at one end, and it takes a very powerful muscle working on that inch that's in the skin to lift that big feather up just to give you a thrill and uh, please its partner and what have you. So muscles play an important role. You know, there are all kinds of evidences for a creator and each of us has our own favorite evidence that we sometimes share with people. It says, boy, if I had no evidence beyond that, I would know there's a God. Well, I'll tell you, one of my lines of evidence that fall into that category is right here. Feathers aren't just willy-nilly on a bird. They're actually in a specific position. You can actually make a map for each bird showing the feather tracks and the position of the feathers. And the feathers are absolutely symmetrical on the left and right side. And when they grow in, they grow in in matched pairs. And when they molt or are shed, they are shed in matched pairs. If this were not true and the feathers were to grow in just any old way and if they were to be in just any old position and if they were to fall out in just any pattern, you could by chance end up with, say, more feathers on one side than the other. And then the bird tries to take off and fly and it goes like a boomerang through the air. I mean, the Lord thinks of everything. Well, there are basically three types of feathers. We have this one sometimes called a counter feather or the primary feather. Let's just call it the big one and you're all familiar with that. And then we have this little feather over here. It's not drawn to scale. It should be much smaller compared to that counter feather. It's the down feather. You've all seen those, the little fluffy feathers. We'll look at one of those in the electron microscope. And then we have a really tiny feather, this one over here that looks huge here, but it would be so tiny that at this magnification of, say, the down feather, you wouldn't be able to even see these. And these little feathers are called phylloplumes. And if you've ever plucked a chicken, and how many people here do we have that have ever plucked a chicken? Oh my goodness, I feel I'm among my people. Uh, most, I think nowadays kids think chickens just grow in boxes that you get at the... But when you take a, a chicken and you pluck it, you know you get all the feathers out and you end up and you have what looks like little fuzz or hairs left. And what do you do to get those off? You hold it over the gas stove or something and you singe them off? Well, that's the phyloplume. And have you ever wondered what they are? Well, I'll tell you, evolutionists have never suggested that they're, you know, evolutionary ancestors of the feather or anything. They're just tiny little structures. And some evidence indicates that what these little tiny hair-like feathers are is they're mechanoreceptors. That is, they are actually feeling the position of the other bigger feathers in the skin. And as the feathers are moved around by their muscles, uh, these little phyloplumes get moved and wiggled, and they send a signal back to the brain telling the bird that this feather is in this position and this one is in this position and keep them all coordinated in flight. Oh my goodness, that's so complicated, I don't think I even want to talk about it anymore. Evolutionists will tell you that the world's oldest bird is Archaeopteryx and uh, it's supposed to be uh, oh, 140 million years old, give or take a week or two one way or another. Uh, but uh, the thing that's amazing is when this bird was first found, given its 
uh, supposed old age and everything. They called it Archaeopteryx, which means ancient wing, and they declared it to be basically half reptile, half bird, and to be the first bird. Today, ornithologists, with very few exceptions, consider Archaeopteryx to simply be a bird. And uh, it's not a half reptile, half bird. It is a bird. One thing we know for sure, these birds were formed in such a beautifully fine uh, matrix, that is, their fossils were made in such a fine rock or material that formed a fine rock, that you can actually see the details of the feather in the fossils. I'll be showing you some of those details in a minute, and you can see a great deal of that even in the fossils. So these are not simply things that look like feathers. They are unquestionably feathers. And they're not just on the wings or on the body and on the head uh, of this Archaeopteryx. Now, in many respects, Archaeopteryx was like any bird you might see today. It had a perching foot with a hallux, had a wishbone, had a strictly typical bird-like skull. It had a bird brain. I mean, how would you like to go through life being so told you have a bird brain? Uh, but there were some things that were unusual about it, too, that you don't see in birds today. One is they had a, a rather long tail, and don't think they wagged this tail like a puppy. It was more like a fishing pole kind of stuck out there. And it had beautiful feathers attached in pairs going all the way out to the end of that. So it would have been kind of like a flexible rod back there with a splay of feathers on it, no doubt used in flight. Another interesting thing is Archaeopteryx had teeth. Uh, no living birds today have true teeth. And Archaeopteryx had fingers on its wings uh, that were exposed. And people think, well, that proves that they were half reptile, half birds. After all, uh, reptiles have teeth. Well, that's true. Some reptiles do have teeth. But hey, some reptiles don't have teeth. And so it really doesn't prove anything with regard to teeth. After all, some amphibians have teeth, some don't. Some reptiles have teeth, some don't. Hey, some humans have teeth and some don't. Isn't that true? <laughs> but what about those fingers on the wings? Well, we have birds today like the ostrich and the ray and the juvenile watsine, which we're showing you here from South America, that uh, in this case of the juvenile watsine, uh, they have fingers on the wings in the juvenile. And these little juvenile birds, here's the adult on the left, a beautiful bird, uh, but the little juveniles actually crawl around in the trees just like a squirrel. And they use their little forelimbs to crawl and everything. And then later as they develop, these fingers sort of regress and uh, uh, it, it just looks pretty much like a standard bird. What about those teeth and that skull on Archaeopteryx? Well, as I mentioned, the skull of this bird that's said to be 140 million years old, and I don't believe that for a second, but uh, this skull is definitely bird-like with the exception of the teeth. What are some of the unusual characteristics of a bird skull? One is, in most animals, and certainly in we humans, the only thing that moves is the lower jaw. Have you noticed that? Lower jaw goes up and down, but upper jaw doesn't really move when you make the lower jaw go. But on birds, the upper jaw goes up and down as well as the lower jaw because there's a little flexion point right here where the bone kind of bends to allow that. And Archaeopteryx could do that. He had a typical bird eye, a bird brain. But he had these teeth. Now, while there are no birds today that have teeth, all of the birds that have teeth have all become extinct, uh, there are birds today that have something that look a lot like teeth. For example, can you see the choppers in this bird's beak here? I mean, is this frightening or what? How would you like to run into this thing in the middle of the night? We've got a bird with what looks like really long, uh, pointed teeth. You're probably wondering what kind of a terrifying, frightening bird is this? It turns out it's a hummingbird. I mean, I've often wondered, what does a hummingbird do with teeth? Does it, like, chew its nectar? Well, we know that some hummingbirds eat insects, and that's possibly the case for this one. And I should remind you that they're really not true teeth. They're not made out of the mineral that teeth are made out of hydroxyapatite. They're really just little horny processes of the beak, but they certainly look like teeth. Well, evolutionists, of course, are interested in how everything evolved, with the possible exception of how evolutionism itself evolved. And uh, they believe absolutely that Reptiles evolved into birds, and because they believe that, they necessarily believe that the uh, reptilian scale evolved into the feather. Uh, that is believed with uh, something that borders on virtual certainty. 
And just a few years ago in the distinguished journal Nature, there was an article in which they hired an artist to illustrate. And in evolutionary terms, if you can get an artist to illustrate it, it pretty much means it happened. And they start out with a scale over on the left that's kind of an elongated scale. And there are reptiles that have a kind of an elongated scale. There's an animal called Longusquama, for example, that has an elongated scale. But it is a scale. It's not a feather by any means. But evolutionists imagine that in the course of evolution, by a completely mindless, purposeless, and goalless process, uh, this scale sort of became frayed, like you see in step two, and to make all these parts, and of course it's in a sort of a Lamarckian way, the, the frayed scale was passed on to its uh, ancestors genetically, don't ask me how that's possible. And then from step two you'd go to step three, but you can't really go from step two to step three because step two is just what we call simple branching. And step three is compound branching. And you can't really get compound branching from simple branching, but I'm not here to really explain it to you. I'm just telling you what the evolutionists say. And then from this compound branch structure, you get another level of compound branching. And then this uh, begins to look like a feather. And so evolutionists imagine that a reptilian scale went through those steps. Well, of course, they have no evidence that it really did go through those steps. And we might ask, why would a scale do that? Why would that be selected for? And evolutionists have spent a great deal of time trying to uh, speculate on, on just uh, how and why uh, feathers evolved from reptile scales. Uh, there are really three basic theories. One's called the arboreal theory, or the tree theory. And uh, it isn't really a theory at all, since there's nothing testable about it. You, you could call it simply the arboreal speculation. And uh, in this speculation, they say that the pre-bird, the proto-bird, had these long scales. And these scales maybe got a little frayed. And then this reptile crawled up into the trees. Now, don't ask me why, but he either fell out or jumped off. And when he or she did this, those reptiles having the longest and most frayed scales hit the ground less hard because these kind of caught the air on the way down. And those that had the less frayed scales, I mean, the end of that one. And then presumably, those who hit the ground less hard crawled up in the tree and tried it again until one day, boom, took off and flew. <laughs> Complete with navigation and all of the other features that birds have. Now, I want you to know that not all evolutionists are taken in by this idea of the arboreal theory. In fact, many evolutionists have pointed out the problem with this theory is there's not the slightest shred of evidence to support it. That is a problem. So this group has come up with an alternative theory called the cursorial theory. And so in the cursorial theory, the scales, again, are long and frayed. Only in this idea, uh, these pre-birds or these reptiles with the frayed scales use those scales to catch insects. So they ran around doing this. Well, being of a, of a rather experimental bent myself, I took some styrofoam board and I cut it in the shape of the wing, and then you see the insect up here he's chasing? I took a piece of tissue paper and tied it to a thread from a rafter in my basement. <laughs> and then I put on the styrofoam wings, <laughs> and I snuck up <laughs> on the tissue paper, and I took my wings and I did that. Do you have any idea what happened? I mean, I can't believe this. This piece of tissue paper, not a speck of life in it, and it flew away. <laughs> well, the people who believe in the arboreal theory have criticized the cursorial theory by pointing out, and quite accurately so, that there's not the slightest shred of evidence to support it. And people have asked me, what do I think? And I say, I think they're both right. There's not the slightest shred of evidence to support either one. <laughs> well, there is one other theory, 
It's really the oldest of the three theories, the thermoregulatory theory, that say that reptilian scales evolved into feathers uh, to keep the reptiles warm as they evolved into warm-blooded creatures. Of course, this involves all kinds of assumptions. But what about that theory, the thermoregulatory theory? Alan Fiducia is one of the great uh, bird uh, people, ornithologist, who has studied the evolution of birds and is an evolutionist, has very serious doubts about uh, birds having evolved from dinosaurs. And uh, he says, indeed, the simplest and most profound objection to all the thermoregulatory theories is why feathers? Feathers are extremely complicated, both structurally and embryologically in their development. And that is certainly true. And yet today, the idea of feathered dinosaurs has become very popular, thanks largely to the National Geographic magazine and Nature and uh, other magazines. And in this issue, published in uh, 1998, they proudly announced that dinosaurs take wings, the origin of birds. And it was about the feathered dinosaurs that have been found in China. And in this issue, they said, we can now say that birds are theropods, that is, T-Rex-type dinosaurs with the little tiny front limbs. We can now say that birds are theropods just as confidently as we can say humans are mammals. So this is what you really call confidence here. And they were speaking of fossils that had been found in the northeast part of China. And uh, up here in Liaoning province, they've been digging up all sorts of fossils, not just dinosaurs and birds, but lots of other kinds of creatures too, typically all kind of mixed together in chaos, uh, aquatic creatures, flying creatures, terrestrial creatures. And uh, one of the first uh, uh, so-called feathered dinosaurs that was reported was called Sinoceroptyx. You see it on the left here. You take one look at this thing, and you know it's not a bird. It has a long tail, has this big rump, big hind limbs, tiny little front limbs. It is a typical theropod-type dinosaur, like a little miniature T-Rex. But what got them excited is if you look along the back, right in here, and you magnify that, there look like little fuzz coming up here. See the little filaments? And they call those proto-feathers. They are the evolutionary beginning of feathers. And they got very excited, feathered dinosaur. Uh, all the students in the high schools and grade schools had to memorize Sinoceroptrix was a feathered dinosaur that was an ancestor of birds. And uh, not all of the evolutionists bought into this idea. In fact, uh, Ann Gibbons in Science Magazine reported that during that time, it said exactly a year ago, paleontologists were abuzz about photos of a so-called feathered dinosaur. But she goes on to say the structures are not modern feathers, say roughly half a dozen Western paleontologists who've seen these specimens. What they think they may be is either a, just a precipitate or more likely collagen fibers. These are connective tissue fibers that are simply protruding from the backs of these creatures. There's nothing about them that suggests that they would be feathers. Not only that, but when you look at the fossil record from Liaoning province, there are a lot of absolutely unarguable birds in that fossil record. For example, here is a bird called Confuciornis sanctus, which nobody denies is a bird. In fact, it's a highly specialized bird with nice big wings and everything here. Uh, but look at these tail feathers. It looks like the feathers you see on a flycatcher. I mean, a very specialized, elongated tail feather. So you have undoubted birds mixed in with dinosaurs which people have just been itching, just itching to show some evidence that they bear feathers, the dinosaurs. Well, uh, in 1999, National Geographic reported the absolute definitive evidence that nobody could argue with. They had a creature that was unquestionably dinosaur-like, in fact, a dinosaur. And it had unquestionably feathers. These were not just little filaments. I mean, this thing had feathers, and it looked like a dinosaur, and that pretty much put a lot of us skeptics in our place. Uh, one little problem. They had to report in a subsequent issue, which they stashed away in the back of the magazine and didn't make a big issue over it, that it turned out to be a hoax. It seems that the farmers in Lanning province can make a great deal of money, even running into the millions, or tens of hundreds of thousands, by crafting together very cleverly fossils that combine together what evolutionists want to see. And they're willing to pay to get it. And uh, some of these people are pretty clever at making these uh, 
composite fossils. When they looked at this fossil under ultraviolet light, they found out that it was exactly what they saw. It was, in fact, a dinosaur. It did, in fact, have feathers, but it was a combination of a dinosaur and a bird fossil cleverly put together. The fellow who found it, Zhu Zeng, said, and I quote from that issue of National Geographic that finally took it back in very small print in the back of the magazine, though I do not want to believe it, Archaeoraptor appears to be composed of a dromaeosaur tail, uh, that is a dinosaur tail and a bird body. Well, Storrs Olson is the curator of birds at the Smithsonian Institute, and after seeing a lot of the efforts on the part of evolutionists to insist that they had found feathered dinosaurs, and after all of the popular discussion of it in National Geographic and Nature, he put an open letter on the internet November 1st of 1999, and uh, among other things, this letter said the following, and this, this man was smoking when he wrote this. This curator of birds from the Smithsonian said the idea of feathered dinosaurs and the theropod origin of birds is being actively promoted by a cadre of zealous scientists acting in concert with certain editors at Nature and National Geographic who themselves have become outspoken and highly biased proselytizers of the faith. Truth and careful scientific weighing of evidence have been among the first casualties in their program which is now fast becoming one of the grander scientific hoaxes of our age. Was he critical or what? He says, there's not one undisputed example of a dinosaur with feathers, none. The public deserves to know this. Well, then National Geographic comes out with another feather dinosaur. This one's called Cynithosaurus. You can see this in museums all over the country. It does indeed have feathers, these, these models, but of course they are pasted on the model. And uh, here is an animal similar to Cynithosaurus showing you the nature of the evidence. If you look at letter A right there, and you magnify that, you see little lines that kind of crisscross, giving a kind of a herringbone pattern. And this has been interpreted as feathers on the skin of the bird. But the evidence is now really pretty compelling that these are not feathers, and they certainly don't look like feathers, but are actually connective tissue fibers in the skin. And uh, Ellen Fiducia, an evolutionist, uh, in his article, Do Feathered Dinosaurs Exist, said we c conclude that protofeathers are probably the remains of collagenous, that is, connective tissue fiber meshworks that reinforce the dinosaur's integument. And this is the way those collagen fibers look. It's a picture I took in the electron microscope. You see the little dots, that's where the fibers are coming at you. And then there's areas where they're not dots, they go longitudinally, and then they go diagonally, and then they come at you, then they go longitudinally. In other words, they're woven together. And this is what confers the mechanical properties to the skin. It's kind of woven. And the way our skin stretches uh, reflects the way it's woven, just like the warp and woof of a fabric. Well, never mind, evolutionists still insist that feathers evolved from reptile scales, specifically dinosaur scales. And to prove the point, they say that feathers and scales are so similar you can hardly tell them apart. Have you noticed that? One of the first people to say this was Gerhard Heilmann back in 1927. In his book, The Origin of Birds, he says the most striking peculiarity of birds is their plumage, which apparently has nothing at all in common with the scaly covering of reptiles. So much more surprising is it on examining these structures in the microscope to learn that the feather is nothing but a further development of the scale. Alfred Romer, very distinguished evolutionist, says birds have been called glorified rep uh, reptiles. Feathers are in reality almost their only distinctive feature. And he says, although these structures seem quite different from the horny scales that cover reptiles' body, the difference is in reality not very great. Well, you can look in your Encarta encyclopedia, if you have one on your computer, look up feathers and they will confidently declare that the feather is a horny outgrowth of skin peculiar to the bird, but similar in structure and origin to the scales of fish and reptiles. So I thought we'd do a little test. I had a laboratory technician that worked for me. They had a pet boa constrictor. And I said, hey, the next time that little rascal sheds its skin, why don't you bring it on in and we'll look at it in the microscope because I understand you can hardly tell a reptile scale from a feather. 
<laughs> and so she did, she waited, and when this little rascal shed his skin, and by the way, I want to point out that no snakes were destroyed to do this study. We waited until they shed naturally. She brought the skin in, we put it under the microscope, and we magnified it, and this is what a boa constrictor scale looks like here. You can see the others around it. And uh, as the evolutionists have told us, uh, if you look at them in the microscope at least, they are remarkably similar to a feather. So then I took a picture of a feather, and I want you to see if you can tell the difference. So you may want to clean your glasses or something right now. If you got this one in mind, Okay, if you get confused, just look at the top, it'll tell you which is which. Okay, that's the scale, uh, this is a feather, what do you think? <laughs> Should I go back and forth, you got it down or? Uh... I mean, why do they say they're similar when they're absolutely not similar? In fact, I'll go further than that. They are totally different. Their mature structure is dissimilar, their function is dissimilar, their embryological development is dissimilar, their mechanism of growth is dissimilar, their mechanism of replacement is dissimilar, their chemical composition is dissimilar. And let's just look at the obvious. Scales are like folds in drapery, like drapery pleats. It's all one sheet. That's like when a reptile sheds scales. He doesn't shed them one at a time or two at a time, does he? The whole thing comes off as one sheet. In fact, reptiles typically have two layers, won't they? An outer layer and an under layer. When they shed the outer layer, then the under layer is exposed. Why do they do that, by the way? Why do they shed their skin? Because they're growing. Now, I want you to think about this. You get a box through the mail, and you're wondering what's in the box. You open up the box, you know what's in the box? A bigger box. <laughs> so you shed the outer layer because the under layer is bigger. Uh, you got to think about that a while. <laughs> Let's look at that boa constrictor skin. The tail's in the direction of the arrow. So to your upper right, that would be the tail. I don't know, a quarter of a mile up there or something like that uh, at this magnification. And uh, you can see the scales are arranged in rows, sort of on the bias with the long axis of the snake. If we get a hold of the right side and flip it over like the page in a book, this is what the underside of the skin looks like. And so now the tail's in the direction to the upper left corner. And again, for those of you in the cheaper seats, let's magnify this a bit. Uh, this is what, where one scale just fit right underneath here. It fit right in there, so when the skin pulled off, that scale pulled right out of that pocket, like taking your hand out of a glove. And that's the way the scales are put together, is one continuous sheet. Now, feathers are completely different. Feathers grow out of follicles, just like hair. Hair grows out of a hair follicle. Feathers grow out of a feather follicle. But I'm here to tell you, there's no such thing as a scale follicle. Now, what is a follicle as it relates to feathers and hair? It's a tube-like depression in the skin. You see it here. It goes down deep in the skin. All of the growth occurs in the bottom in what's called a growth collar. The feather grows out sort of looking like a thick hair. And when it comes out of the, to the surface of the skin, it all unfolds to make the feather. This is the way the feather follicle looks down on the skin. All of the growth is occurring here. And the feather is alive at this point, but as it makes all of its parts, it dies. It goes through a programmed cell death so that the feather that emerges from the skin is completely dead. This is how it all develops. Inside the shell here, we have what we call a pen feather. If you peel this shell away, you can see that this is the growth region at the bottom. The shaft goes up along the backside there. And then the barbs grow off this growth ring. And those little barbs get longer and longer. They grow from each side and meet at the other side. When the feather comes out of the follicle, the cylinder opens up, the barbs all swing down, and you get this big, broad feather out of a hole in the skin that's not much bigger than the shaft. And that's the way each feather grows from living cells, goes through a programmed cell death, and rises up out of the follicle uh, in that way. A down feather looks like this. It has a shaft, and it has these barbs that stick out from the shaft, but the barbs are not attached to one another. Down feathers don't have Velcro. They just have a bunch of barbs, and it makes them nice and fluffy and uh, uh, is good for insulation, uh, for heat. 
the feather you're more accustomed to is this uh, type of a primary feather here. And what we're going to do is cut a little piece off the feather vein. We call this the vein on either side. And when we do, we magnify it. And you'll notice there are three barbs here that we managed to cut out. And each of those barbs have little barbs, almost making it look like it's a, a little miniature feather. And they are called barbules. In fact, let's just look at a typical uh, feather. A typical feather has one shaft or rachis. Does that make sense? One shaft up the center. A typical feather has two veins. That is on either side of the shaft or rachis is a vein. Okay, one over here, one over here. And then each of those veins has about 400 barbs. It would depend on the size of the feather. We're just talking average. And we're looking at three of the 400 here. And if you look at one of those barbs, one of those 400 barbs in a vein, each barb on average has 800 little barbs called barbules. Those are the things you see here protruding from it. And they're divided into barbules that face the tip of the feather up here and those that face uh, to the posterior part of the feather. And so they're called anterior barbels and posterior barbels, and it starts to get a little ridiculous, but each of the anterior barbels has little hooks on it, and there's about 20 little hooks on each barbule. As you can see, your basic reptilian scale. <laughs> now, let's just take you, we're, we're going to pretend we're a feather mite, and we're going to crawl down into a feather. And we're just going to magnify this feather and magnify this feather. In fact, I call this magnifying the Lord. Because after you see and hear what you're about to see, you are left without excuse when you go before the judgment throne of God. Here's the shaft of a feather. The vein is on either side. Here are the barbs. From the barbs, we see the barbules. Can you see the little posterior barbels here? And underneath the anterior barbels are crisscrossing them like this. Let's crank up the power. You can see it's a dirty bird. It's got some dirt on the feather. Uh, here are barbs going by, and the posterior barbels are here. The anterior barbels are underneath. Let's crank up the power some more. Now we can see the shaft. Here are the barbs, posterior barbels, anterior barbels, crisscrossing. This is what I saw when I first put this feather in the microscope. You can see how I was just floored when this came up. Crank up the power some more. <laughs> here are the posterior barbels. The anterior barbels, now we know it's the anterior barbels that have the hooks. So if we're going to see the hooks, we have to lift the posterior barbels off. If we do that, there are the hooks in the anterior barbels. And notice to keep the wind from going through between the barbels, there's a little flap that uh, keeps the air from getting through. And then, of course, these little flaps have a double interference layer on it, so when the light hits it, it produces the iridescent colors. Let's put the feather back together again. The anterior barbels are going from lower left to upper right. Posterior barbels are going from lower right to upper left. So they're crisscrossing. And this is that little Velcro mechanism I was talking about, only this is God's Velcro. It makes man's Velcro look like junk. Here are the little hooks. Can you see the hook here? On the posterior barbel, you have a little ridge. Think of like a celery stick. They have a little groove going down them. And the idea is the hook of the anterior barbel has to grip the lip on this ridge. Of course, the hooks are back here, and the ridge is over here. Can you see that? They're apart. So to get the hook to grasp the ridge, you have to have a hinge on each of these little millions and millions of little hooks per, per bird and per feather. So that allows the hook to go over and grab the ledge. But of course, the radius of curvature of the hook must precisely match the radius of curvature of the lip for it to hang on to it. If the hook's too big or too small, it's not going to work. Well, let's uh, take this feather and flip it over. So we're looking at the other side. Now the hooks are going down instead of pointing up, and let's just crank up the power and see what the Lord has wrought here. Here you can see the hooks are disengaged. They're not grasping onto the posterior barbels. We see a little strut along here, and that little strut strengthens the barbule so that it doesn't bend in the air. Let's crank up the power. This is the highest power I'll show you. And when we get up to this power, we can see the hooks are engaged. There's a little guide finger here. Can you see it that guides the hook in? And this is the hinge 
The hinge is like a strap hinge that bends like a piece of metal or something. That keeps the hook moving like this and doesn't allow it to go left and right. And there's millions and millions and millions of these per bird. And they all hook automatically. When the bird takes its beak and grooms its feathers, preens the feathers, these millions of little hooks all automatically hook together. And this allows the bird to fly. Uh, it's no wonder that when Darwin looked at a peacock feather, uh, he had a friend, Asa Gray, that said, Darwin, Charlie, he says, what do you think of the peacock's feather? <laughs> and Charlie wrote a letter back to his friend saying, the sight of a peacock's tail when I gaze at it makes me sick. <laughs> Why did that gorgeous feather make Darwin sick? Because when he looked at that, he was without excuse. He could see the handiwork of God right in his face and to deny it gave him a psychosomatic illness with which he suffered his whole life. He was just sick. He had to live with the overwhelming evidence for creation, with the lack of the fossil evidence for his theory of evolution, and yet he had to believe it because he had abandoned God altogether. Well, what a pleasure it is to be a Christian. What a pleasure it is to look at a peacock's tail and have your heart just jump with joy to see what God has made. And finally, let's just close with what the Bible says about birds in Matthew 10, verse 29 and following. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father, so don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. Well, that'll have to hold you, and I thank you very kindly. <laughs>